Alright, so Hurricane Katrina, Cyclone Yasi, and Typhoon Haiyan, they're all referring to the same type of weather phenomenon and that is Tropical Cyclone. So this is what we're going to do in this particular video. We're going to look at Gateway 3 of Weather and Climate. So stay tuned and yeah, let's go. <laughs> So in this video, we're going to explore about the characteristics of tropical cyclone, uh, the impacts that it can bring as well as what are some of the responses that can help to mitigate the impact of tropical cyclones. So without further ado, let's take a look at this um, very messy mind map. Um, I wouldn't say it's a mind map, but basically it covers some of the important points that you should know in Gateway 3. And basically like what we've studied in the previous video, we understand that global warming now drives the increase in the frequency of tropical cyclones as well as the strengths of tropical cyclones uh, around the world right now. Uh, but before we even go in depth, uh, we have to first understand about what are some of the characteristics of tropical cyclones, um, what are the essential components that will actually create a tropical cyclone. So uh, first of all, you need warm ocean waters. Now in this case, the ideal temperature is actually above 26.5 degrees Celsius. Yes. All right. And next, you need moisture laden air. And that's why uh, tropical cyclones can actually bring about a torrential rain as well. We'll talk about that later. And the next thing is that in order for the ocean surface to be warm, uh, it should be ideally um, originated within the tropics and in this case um, the ideal latitude would be 8 to 15 degrees north and south of the equator. Now question over here is why isn't it found at 0 to 8 degrees north and south? Uh, the reason is because a Coriolis effect must be present for the tropical cyclones to be formed in the first place. So therefore it would not be ideal for tropical cyclones to be formed within 0 to 8 degrees north and south. Alright and of course it's found within the tropics because you need the warm waters and therefore with this combination you will get a perfect fuel for tropical cyclones to actually be formed in the first place. So adding on to what we've just mentioned, tropical cyclones, even though they tend to originate in tropical waters, uh, if we look and observe the path travelled by most of the tropical cyclones, it is important to notice that they can actually affect countries that are beyond the tropical regions and they can move into the subtropical regions affecting um, parts of North America as well as um, parts of Asia such as Japan, Taiwan, China, places like that. Alright, so um, do take note that um, tropical cyclones are not um, only affecting countries within the tropical regions. Now that we have understood where tropical cyclones can be found, uh, the next thing that we need to take some time to understand would be how are tropical cyclones formed. I understand that this is not within the syllabus but it's good to know a brief understanding of the formation. Alright, so now let's just visualize this as the warm ocean surface. Okay, so this is 8 degrees north and this is 15 degrees north of the equator. So this ocean surface is actually warm. So as the warm air above this ocean surface is heated up, it expands and it rises. So it leaves behind a zone of low pressure. And we have understood in Gateway 1 that air moves from a region of higher pressure to a region of lower pressure. So we can now visualize the air that's in the surrounding environment starts moving in, all right, into this low pressure system. And because it's heated up, it rises, and now you get this continuous motion of air coming in, and then it rises. Right? And plus the fact that because it's 8 to 15 degrees north and south of the equator, there's Coriolis effect. So the air now starts spinning and it starts spinning in an anti-clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere and whereas in the southern hemisphere it would be a clockwise direction. And basically as it starts spinning, we can now picture the entire process of the winds moving inwards and spinning upwards. Okay, so 
over time, this uh, warm ocean body will fuel this um, system of air and therefore it slowly develops into a tropical cyclone. So I hope this is a very brief explanation but I hope you have a, a better understanding and a visualization of how tropical cyclones are formed. So now back to this. Um, now when we look at tropical cyclones itself, we do understand that there are three things that it can bring about. First of all, strong winds. Um, secondly, we have storm surges and lastly with torrential rain. So now strong winds, um, the reason is because as the warm ocean body fuels the cyclone, it actually moves faster and faster so it can reach a sustained speed of at least 119 kilometers per hour. So we understand that with this high speed, it can actually cause severe destruction once it makes landfall. So what I mean by landfall is basically when the tropical cyclones actually reaches land. All right. So um, the reason for such a high speed is because of the steep pressure gradient, like what we've mentioned in Gateway 1. Okay. So um, because of the strong winds, there's some things that we have to take note of. It can actually lead to destruction of infrastructures. It can also lead to the loss of lives, such as if someone's actually within the vicinity and if a flying debris actually hit the person it can actually cause injury or death and of course when we talk about destruction of infrastructure it's good to take note that infrastructure doesn't only mean um, buildings it can also mean um, roads as well as bridges and therefore it can affect accessibility into the area that's affected and this can be linked to a point where search and rescue operations may be hindered uh, due to the limited accessibility into the areas that's uh, affected. And of course, uh, the destruction of infrastructure will therefore lead to the displacement of people from their homes. And yeah, these are some of the typical impacts that we can actually talk about whenever we're explaining about tropical cyclones. Now, next. Strong winds can also lead to storm surges. As the wind energy is very high, the series of waves that are generated, right, they are also carrying a lot of wave energy. Now, can you imagine with very strong winds that are traveling at 119 kilometers per hour, blowing across the ocean surface, this will actually force a mass of water up onto the land itself as storm surge and since all the storm surge are carrying a lot of wave energy it can actually travel further inland up to 15 kilometers inland and therefore it can lead to severe inland flooding all right so when severe inland flooding occurs this can actually lead to disruption of water supply so we can just think about this as um, let's say if there's a breakage of water pipes um, the drinking water supply may be contaminated when the flood waters are actually mixed with it and this can actually lead to um, secondary impacts such as waterborne diseases such as cholera or typhoid fever and at the same time if there is a poor drainage system in the long run um, if the water is not adequately drained out, you have pools of stagnant water that's left behind and this can also lead to secondary impacts such as infectious insect borne diseases that are spreading around the area. All right, next would be destruction of agricultural farms. Now, this is actually dependent on the country itself. So if there are countries with agricultural farmlands that are located along the coastal area, then a storm surge will actually destroy all those farmlands. And if the country's um, food supply is heavily dependent on the local agricultural produce, and uh, what we will notice is that in the long run, they might experience a problem of food shortage, and the country will therefore have to rely on foreign aid uh, to overcome this problem. So good to consider which country and the context before we write in the impacts of tropical cyclones. So the next thing that we can consider would be torrential rain. Like I said just now, um, since um, tropical cyclones are formed on warm ocean waters, um, the air itself is moisture laden and therefore you notice that this can actually bring about torrential rain once the tropical cyclone reaches landfall. Okay. So um, therefore, if you think about uh, this entire context, if there's torrential rain, this firstly can lead to severe inland flooding. So basically, if you think about it, if um, that particular coastal area has a river, uh, then in this case, it might cause the river to overflow, which can further worsen the problem of inland flooding. If not, then if it's a mountainous region, so the worst uh, possible scenario that can happen would be that when torrential rain occurs, um, they, this can actually destabilize the slope 
slope and therefore it can lead to landslide and basically it can affect the communities that are located at the base of the slope basically resulting in high death toll as well as people uh, being displaced from their homes. Alright, so um, like I said, all these points in red, um, it's actually dependent on the context itself. It's not applicable for all countries. So do take some time and understand whatever that has been provided to you in the exam question in the figure itself and you can choose whichever that's applicable. All right, now that we have explained the impacts of tropical cyclones, I think it's time to show you this, um, the various considerations that you can take note of during examinations. Um, so first of all, location. Now, whenever you're explaining about impacts, right, it's good to consider location, whether it's a coastal area or inland area, because coastal environments, of course, they are vulnerable to all the, strong, all the three points, strong wind, uh, storm surges, as well as torrential rain, but inland area they are also vulnerable to um, storm surge as well as torrential rain. A reason why strong winds do not affect inland areas because tropical cyclones uh, they actually thrive with warm ocean waters right so when they are moving on land they will slowly dissipate so therefore um, inland areas are usually not affected by the strong winds okay and um, at the same time when we are talking about location it's also good to consider um, the environment um, so if a particular area that's hit by tropical cyclones um, also has a river running through it, then chances are um, the impact of inland flooding will be worsened because the torrential rain plus the storm surge may actually cause the river to overflow. Okay, so um, next we have strength of tropical cyclone. Of course, this is something to consider. Um, tropical cyclones, we actually categorize them. So category one to five. All right, and then next, DCs versus LDCs. This point itself is important in um, understanding that in a less developed country, um, the infrastructure will usually be unable to withstand um, the impacts of tropical cyclone and at the same time um, in the LDC context the uh, impact will be worse because um, usually they do not have proper uh, prediction and warning systems and um, the citizens are not well prepared they are not equipped with the knowledge of how to evacuate or um, which evacuation route to take so these are some of the considerations that you can take note of when you are comparing um, DCs versus LDCs and then um, when you're explaining about the impact, it's also good to consider um, the particular economic sector uh, that the country focuses on. So like I said just now, if a country um, focuses a lot on agricultural industry, then if they have agricultural farmlands that are located along the coastal area, in this case, they will experience a significant economic impact. Okay, so um, next we have the government's willingness to accept foreign aid. So um, in this case, uh, we are looking at some countries, um, for instance, the LDCs, some of them are not willing to accept foreign aid. Um, so in this case, this will only worsen uh, the impact and will lead to greater and higher death toll, especially when all the secondary impacts such as um, the spread of insect-borne and waterborne diseases uh, outbreak uh, happening uh, due to the accumulation of stagnant water or contaminated water. Okay, and um, next would be responses of people and usually this is tied into um, DCs and LDCs because if there are proper evacuation routes that are laid out as well as the people are equipped with the knowledge, then um, the response will be more efficient and therefore this can help to reduce the death toll. And lastly, also good to consider two other things and they are the type of soil as well as the topography of the area. Uh, reason is because, like I said earlier on, um, torrential rain, especially in the mountainous region, can actually lead to landslides um, and this can actually cause severe destruction to the communities that are located at the base of the slope itself. So yeah, very good to consider the type of soil if it's unconsolidated uh, plus the fact that there's torrential rain definitely can lead to landslides. So um, yeah, hopefully all these considerations are useful in helping you internalize the impacts and to justify your point. All right, one example is actually the 2017 O-level question. It's the 8 marks levels question and it says that impacts of tropical cyclones are mainly economic. 
To what extent do you agree with this statement? Use examples to support your answer. Before we start writing our answer, I think the best way is to first plan out what are all the different possible factors, uh, what are the different points that you can talk about that you have sufficient to write about and you have a case study to support and then after which think about a concept that you can use in your conclusion to weigh. So I would ask the students to really consider all the different possible impacts. So for instance, economic impact, I can talk about um, the high economic costs uh, due to the destruction of infrastructure and then the next thing it would be a physical impact, right? The physical destruction of the coastal environment and then the next thing would be social impact. So you can bring in things like um, the outbreak of waterborne diseases um, after the occurrence of a tropical cyclone and um, now that I have come up with all these points I need to consider a concept uh, whereby I can apply it uh, in my conclusion to weigh so I need to also think about the stand so in this case if I want to state that my stand that um, tropical cyclones primarily bring about economic impact right then I need to consider a particular context whereby this is true so what kind of context uh, will this uh, particular statement be true? It will most likely be an LDC community uh, or highly uh, densely populated community along the coastal area. So in this case, uh, I stated down specifically in my conclusion and I say that LDC communities, due to their limited financial capacity and resources, uh, the infrastructures are not built to withstand uh, the impacts of tropical cyclones such as the strong wind as well as uh, the storm surges and therefore uh, this will lead to severe destruction of infrastructures along the coastal community and this will actually incur high economic cost. Alright, so um, I guess you need to really think about this carefully before you even start writing and that's always the advice that I would give my students. Alright, now that we've understood the impacts of tropical cyclone, it's good that we can start to look at what are the different ways to reduce the impacts. In this case, we are referring to death toll as well as the economic cost. So um, we have two main points with emergency action as well as mitigation measure. Now I guess in the textbook it has been stated very clearly so I'll run through the key point over here. In this case emergency action what it does is that it can help to reduce death toll and not so much of economic cost. The reason is because for emergency action we are looking at things like how the government can swiftly and efficiently um, evacuate the citizens. Um, at the same time we are also looking at the uh, deployment of the search and rescue operations um, to find um, this, uh, the victims uh, from the site itself and to provide them with the necessary medical aid um, so as to reduce the chances of them um, dying and therefore reducing the overall death toll. Okay, so next we have mitigation measures. So we have prediction and warning systems, land use control. Now this can come in two forms, coastal plain management as well as flood plain management. So coastal plain management refers to the areas that are vulnerable to storm surge whereas floodplain management are referring to the areas that are on either side of the rivers and lastly we have um, infrastructure strategies basically referring to how we can reinforce the infrastructures to withstand the impact of tropical cyclones so I hope by now you should be able to realize that all three measures are usually applicable for developed countries rather than less developed countries because they are costly uh, to implement as well as um, the fact that you require the cooperation of the residents living in the area. Alright, so we've come to the end of this particular gateway and I hope that whatever that I've mentioned in this video has been useful in helping you in your revision. So like I said before, do feel free to drop any of the comments down in the comments below as well as you can DM me your questions on Instagram and we'll see each other in the next video and we're going to talk about this highly requested chapter which is the chapter of food resources and we'll see each other in the next episode and bye!